Shapiro was saying, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be back at South Pasadena 290. I affiliated here, I believe it was 2013 through 2014. We were living in Highland Park at the time, my wife and I. And uh, we just had a great time here. I sat over in the uh, northeast corner of the lodge there playing organ and uh, really got to meet some incredible masons here that really helped to, you know, set the trajectory of my Masonic career going, going forward from there. I think about these guys a lot. Uh, the Illumination series, as Romero was uh, mentioning, that began, I believe, around that time. It might have been that year, 2013. Dago headed it up. Uh, I know Marco, um, Marco was on that committee. I was on that committee. Dago did the first one. I forget what it was on. I did the second lecture. It was, uh, I think I did Freemasonry and Tarot at that time. But uh, can everybody see those, or do you need to? Should we dim it a little more? Is that good? Okay. Uh, so, I'm going to try and make a, what could be a pretty dry topic uh, as lively as possible. I think these slides should help to that effect. I don't have my old gauge that I used to use when we would do our lectures here. I know if I could keep Charlie awake and Don Johansson awake, then I was doing a good job. So I would, I would look at them too and make sure that everybody was still, you know, and if that was happening, I felt like it, I was a success. Uh, so, Myth, Magic, and Masonry. This is my book. It was put out in August of uh, last year. August 2018. The Laudable Pursuit put it out. They're a Masonic imprint. Uh, they've also put out things like uh, uh, P.D. Newman's Alchemically Stoned, which made quite a splash last year. It continues to reverberate. It's a great guy. It's a great book. Uh, so it's basically a comparative study of ceremonial magic, uh, classical mythology, astrological symbolism, and mystery traditions, but primarily Mithraism, uh, from the perspective of Freemasonry. And uh, some people have asked, why is there a minotaur and a zodiacal wheel on there? And I hope to I hope to clarify that because it, you may look at that and then look myth, magic, and masonry and not quite know how that fits together. So I think what I've what I've done in this presentation is sort of bring out why that is. What what is the theme that uh, runs through my book? How many how many of you have read my book? Handful. So so I hope to elucidate uh, some of the things that I brought up in my book. You know where. I, I didn't make a deep dive into every one of those subjects, but I was tracing a narrative through them that I'm not sure has that I made explicit enough. But I'm going to remedy that for you here now, um, the sort of underlying theme. But before I do that, we're going to orient ourselves, uh, and we're going to first take a look at that word, orientation. Um, so, we're concerned with definition number two. I think I got these from Merriam-Webster. Uh, the positioning of something, or the position or direction in which something lies. So, that's important to us, uh, particularly because we're, we're, we're looking from a certain vantage point at these subjects, and that vantage point, as the word suggests, uh, is the east. So if you look at the word, of course, it's orientation. I mean, it's a word that you don't need to be a code breaker to see that, you know, the word orient is in there. Uh, it's, an, it's an ancient perspective, so to, so to visualize some of our symbolism and our allegories and to have that, you know, have that sort of orientation or that directionality in the interpretation of our, like the point within the circle. I know somebody's doing a talk on a point within the circle. You know, using that as an orientation for, for the interpretation and the explication of our symbol sets that we have. So, specifically what we're looking at, however, is 
there are two times of the year when the sun rises due east and sets due west. And those are the equinoxes. The vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. Uh, the sun rises due east at that time. So uh, we're specifically focusing on the vernal equinox for, for my thesis here. Uh, that's going to help make sense. That's sort of the ancient New Year's Day. In fact, if we look at some old calendar systems, uh, Akitu, from the word barley, uh, in, uh, was, the, was the Babylonian New Year. So there, there are other... There are other calendrical systems that use the that use the east and specifically the vernal equinox as their starting point. Uh, you can even see that in in our calendar today. So we have, uh, if you were to count from March, let's say March, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, eight, November, nine. December 10. So you can still see the remnants of that ancient new year beginning at the vernal equinox. Uh, it was the Roman calendar. In fact, it was much more explicit in the Roman calendar in that um, June and July were quintilis and sextilis. June, July. No, that was July and August, I believe. July and August were quintilis and sextilis. So. Um, and then when we went to the Julian and the uh, Gregorian calendars, of course, things were offset with the addition of January, February. So currently, the uh, currently the vernal equinox occurs in the sign of Pisces, and uh, but that wasn't always the case due to a, a phenomenon called axial precession that that uh, it's a slow gyration in the axis in the earth's axis which causes a 30 degree segment of the, a 30 degree segment of the ecliptic right is in it hosts the vernal equinox for 2160 years so I'm going to try and break that down a little bit just because it's important to set that as the vantage point. There are precessional ages. The vernal equinox will occur in one of those 30 degree segments of the ecliptic for 2,160 years. Each, 30 de each degree in that 30 degrees will, will span 72 years for the for the vernal equinox to precess or go backward through that through that period of time. So 72 years per degree, 2,160 years per sign of the zodiac, 30, a 30 degree division of the ecliptic or a segment on the ecliptic. And then I believe it's 25,920 years to make it all the way through. So to go from, say, Pisces or Aries, the first point of Aries, all the way around to proceed through the houses of the zodiac to have the vernal equinox again at Aries takes 25,920 years. So we're going to go back, we're going to follow these precessional ages back and look at the sets of symbols that are embodied in that 2160 year period. Just so we can orient ourselves and, and take us back to, the, to the, van, the temporal vantage point that I'm trying to set up here. So if we look at the Piscean Age, for example, commencing around 1 CE, you could, you could say around the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, and as you know, uh, Jesus was the fisher of men. Uh, ictus, the Greek word ictus, was an acrostic for, for uh, usually represented in that, that piscis shape, that fish symbol. Uh, you'll notice Jesus is 
within the Vesica Piscus in that, uh, that first segment there. He's also surrounded by the tetramorph. You can see the man, the eagle, the lion, and the bull. Which, anytime you see those, I'll get more into that, but anytime you see those, you can pretty much suspect that there's going to be some astronomical symbolism happening regarding those fixed signs, which we'll talk about soon. But if you see in those little pictures, uh, Jesus with the two fishermen here, uh, netting for fish. Uh, you can see the little boy next to Jesus has the two fish in the plate. That sort of um, fish symbolism is common in, in the, regarding that Piscean age, as evidenced by uh, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ particularly. You'll also note that uh, he was sometimes referred to as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, because Aries, the preceding sign, or the following sign, but preceding, uh, was, was the, is the beginning of, even NASA will say that. So zero right ascension begins at the first point of Aries. And Aries proceeded into, into Pisces. So thereby the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the fisher of men, etc. If we look at the Aryan age and some of the symbolism occurring around that time, so that would be the 2160 year period before 1 CE, let's say if we decide to place our marker there. there different authorities vary on when that processional marker exactly lies. But if we look at some of the symbolism from the Aryan age, we see uh, various pictures of Moses there with ram's horns. Uh, we see Dionysus with, uh, with his ram's horns. That is Kanun, who is an Egyptian deity. Um, there's the temple Karnak at Luxor with the, the avenue of the sphinxes. They are Aryan sphinxes there. Uh, Moses blowing the shofar, or the ram's horn, and uh, another sort of Jupiter almond, uh, almond Ra era sphinx, the, uh, an Aryan sphinx. So it's, uh, when Moses blew the shofar, kind of marks the beginning of that period because he came down off of Mount Sinai, right? Whether this is legendary, taken legendarily or allegorically or whether it's literal, um, Moses came down off of Mount Sinai, blew the ram's horn because he saw people worshiping a golden calf, right? And this golden calf, you've heard this story before, uh, this golden calf can be said from this interpretation to represent the Torian age, which preceded the Aryan age. So if we look at some of the symbolism from the Torian age, we see, um, as I said, the, the golden calf. There's also, uh, that's a frieze from Knossos on Crete uh, with bull leaping, which was a common activity in, in Minoan culture. Uh, we, the Iranian bowl, and there's, we'll get into more of these, but there is a, a proliferation of bowl symbolism and cow symbolism, cattle cult symbolism within that 2160 period, 2160 year period, which would have spanned from approximately, would have commenced right around the year 4000 BC give or take. And as I said, authorities vary on that, so we can't pinpoint the exact marker. But we can say that commencing around 4000 BCE, we see the beginning of a, of a lot of Taurian symbolism regarding the Taurian processional age. So, so if we go to that Taurian processional age at 4000 BCE, we will find that the vernal, that Taurus, 
that the vernal equinox occurred in Taurus, the zodiacal house of Taurus. So that means on March 20th, when the sun came up, it would have came up in the house of in the zodiacal sign of Taurus. And that would have occurred, as I said, for 2,160 years. So, if, if Taurus were in the east, as it were, then in the west we would have had uh, Scorpio. So, the autumnal equinox would have been occurring in Scorpio. Uh, and the, the summer solstice would have occurred in Leo. And the winter solstice would have occurred in Aquarius. So those are the fixed signs of the zodiac. The zodiac is divided up into quadruplicities or quaternaries, and they are fixed, cardinal, and mutable. If any, if there are any astrologers here. So uh, the fixed signs are Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. Uh, you may recognize those as the four living creatures or the tetramorph from scripture. So we'll see here there's um, recently I was back east, I was at uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. It's up uh, it's kind of upper west side. And uh, there's, there's exactly one of those. There's Jesus in a vesica piscis surrounded by the tetramorph. So, uh, he's surrounded by the man, the eagle, the lion, and the bull. In this lower bar relief right here. Um, quickly, just to touch on the, the eagle. Uh, the eagle and Scorpio were conflated, presumably, and nobody, there, nobody knows this for sure, but because it's hard to find a source that's uh, an ancient source for this information. There are a couple people, I've kind of sourced this. I've got a few friends who are kind of trying to work on the oldest source for this. And uh, presumably the conflation between Scorpio and the eagle, or Aquila, is because of the vicinity that the constellation Aquila occurs near Scorpio. So it's several degrees off, but that may have changed at some point, or there may have been a different marking system. However, we could say pretty much with certainty that, uh, that Aquila, or the eagle, is standing in for Scorpio. Uh, now, whether that is a Babylonian conflation, something the Chaldeans did, or whether that is something the Romans did, or whether it came up later, uh, we're not quite sure, but I, I know for a fact some great minds are working on it. I'd like to see those results at some point. Um, the predecessor, you'll also notice uh, the, the carabine of Ezekiel's vision. So, if you remember that sequence, that sort of Merkabah sequence where the, the chariot wheels within wheels, um, and the, the four faces. They had the faces of a, a man, a lion, a bull, and an eagle. Four faces in one, facing cardinal directions. Uh, sometimes you'll hear, uh, that's sort of a linchpin of some, not that I'm going to get into any ancient a astronaut stuff, but uh, that is a linchpin of some of their theorizing. Uh, so you've probably seen some of that on the television if you watch that program. But uh, they have a predecessor in Babylonian sphinxes. Uh, they guarded the Mesopotamian tree of life. Now if you look at this animal, you'll see lion's paws, uh, bull's hooves, the eagle's wings, the face of a man. Right. So these sphinxes uh, are the predecessor to, or the maybe the earliest specimen of that conglomeration of symbols. So you'll see those four fixed signs are present um, in Babylonian astronomical symbolism. So 
there again is another another uh, clue to a Torian a Torian arrangement that the vernal equinox occurs in Taurus, the summer solstice occurs in Leo, the uh, autumnal equinox occurs in Scorpio or the Eagle, and the winter solstice occurs in Aquarius. Uh, so, what we're going to do, so that's kind of the setup. I know that's a lot to bite off just for the setup. Axial precession is something that astronauts work on, and I don't think any of us here are an astronaut. Uh, that's a lot of mathematics, a lot of astrophysics and things like that. I'm not going to pretend to know anything more than, you know, the basics about that. But uh, axial precession is a thing, and there are sets of symbols that embody these 2,160-year periods. So, as long as we establish that, now we establish that we're at 4,000 BCE, the beginning of the Taurian age, more or less. Uh, so, in the following, I intend to show how ceremonial magic, classical mythology, Mithraism, and Freemasonry are indelibly stamped with uh, and connected by allusions to this age. Uh, these um, arts and philosophies are united by links forged in that Torian processional age. That's the, that's the main thread, Ariadne's thread, as it were, of uh, my thesis here. So we begin, we begin looking through the lens of comparative mythology. Uh, if we look at some of this symbolism in Egypt, we'll see like middle period Egypt, we see Bach, uh, she's in the top left there. Um, and she was a cow goddess whose, whose sort of archetypal role was subsumed um, by Hathor. Uh, probably a representative of a late Paleolithic cattle cult. And uh, she, she was worshipped at Hu, which is the seventh known in Upper Egypt. And... Uh, there's some of her symbolism and some of Hathor's symbolism, which uh, is pretty pervasive and, and would have occurred around that time. If we go over to Crete and we look at some of the Minoan culture, which we know they were active around that period as well, comfortably within that Taurian age, then we see... Um, the, the whole myth surrounding the Minotaur is, is, is pretty, uh, stands out pretty well in that. Pacif if you don't know the myth, uh, Pasiphae slept with a bull sent by Zeus. Um, Minos, who was the king of the Minoan civilization at Knossos there, uh, had, the, had the baby, the product of that union, uh, put into a labyrinth on Crete built by uh, Daedalus. Daedalus was a, uh, an engineer, you might say, from that period, a genius engineer from that period. Uh, he built this inescapable labyrinth uh, at which, in which they, you know, they put the Minotaur. So there were sacrifices around that time. Uh, Theseus um, came among volunteers from, from Athens to hopefully put a stop because he was, uh, King Minos was charging sort of a ransom or he was demanding sacrifices during that time and, uh, and they were being killed by the Minotaur in this, in this, uh, this labyrinth. Uh, Theseus ends up going in and through the, from the help of Ariadne, he unwinds the thread as he goes into the labyrinth and he's, he slays the Minotaur, he's able to make his way out. Now this could be read as uh, if Theseus, if you look at him as a solar anthropomorphization, you could read this as being uh, Theseus is the sun in Taurus. So he's slaying the bull. Uh, as you'll see later when we look at uh, the Tauroctony and Mithraic symbolism, which has been read to which has been read to reflect that as well. If we 
we look at these two classics from uh, classic episodes from Greek mythology, we see uh, the rape of Europa on the left there, where uh, Zeus, disguised as a bull, uh, in one of his many trysts, uh, entices Europa to, to ride on his back and, take, and abducts her. Uh, and where does he take her to? And he takes her to Crete, which is the center of Minoan civilization. Uh, there on the right, we have Zeus and Yo. Um, Yo is, a, is that, that white cat right there. Uh, so you'll see in this picture, if you know anything about Greek mythology, you probably know about Hera's wrath. Hera was Zeus's wife. You can see Zeus there is a is uh, down there with his arm around the cow, as if to say, I'm not doing anything, I'm just here hanging out with this cow. <laughs> while, while, uh, while Hera is, um, you know, preceded by her peacocks there, suspects otherwise. So, she sends, uh, she sends, a, she, she sends, Yo, in some versions of the myths, she sends Yo out to be forever chased by a gadfly, which is stinging her and, and uh, just essentially bothering her, bothering her for eternity. Uh, also trying to keep her away from, from Zeus. You could also see bull and cattle symbolism in a lot of the myths of the East from around that period as well. Uh, I'm not too well versed in Eastern mythology or many Eastern traditions, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's Shiva. And Shiva, uh, there was, if I remember this myth, he was sometimes also uh, interpreted as a solar anthropomorphism in the uh, Trimurti, right? So you had Brahma, I believe, Vishnu, and Shiva. Rama, Vishnu, and Shiva. Shiva in the West, is that right? So, uh, there's one myth I heard about uh, regarding Pravarti, and Pravarti was, uh, she was a princess, I believe she was associated with the Himalayas, so she of the hills, Pravarti of the hills. And her, her union with Shiva was when the sun set, when the sun set, in the uh, Himalayas there was sort of mythologized into Shiva and the union of Shiva and Pravarti. So, but there, there are copious other myths in other cultures that support this sort of Taurian symbolism. The, again, the vernal equinox occurring in Taurus around that time. I'm really trying to hammer that home because that's so central to what we're talking about here. Uh, if we look at Mithraism, so moving on from comparative mythology into the mystery cult of Mithraism, that was the preferred cult of the Roman legionaries. And you'll see that uh, Mithras um, was originally a mythological character or a persona or archetype in uh, Persian mysteries, particularly uh, those of Zor Zoroastrianism. Uh, so you see Gavivodata is the name of that bowl um, that you see in bas relief there and in, in sculpture here and also depicted in that engraving. Uh, it was a, a sacred Iranian or Persian uh, symbolism regarding uh, superficially a Zoroastrian archetypal pantheon sort of, but uh, a little more, you know, interpreted, interpreted astrologically, that would be another form of uh, sort of pointing to Taurian symbolism, the Taurian age. Next, we have Probably the most conspicuous uh, piece of Torian symbolism is the Torah And this is Mithras 
surmounting and slaying the bull. So it is sometimes interpreted as the sun, again, the sun rising at the vernal equinox in the zodiacal house, or zodiacal sign of Taurus. So there are other things in that picture where, uh, which may cause we as Masons to uh, take notice are those, uh, those two characters, Cautes and Cautapetes, on the right and left, the far right and left, with their legs crossed like this. Uh, these are, in some, some interpretations, akin to the St. John, or the solstices. So you see the equinox in the center, that is the sun in, in Taurus, at the vernal equinox. On either side of that, you see the summer and winter solstices the, with the, the, the high fire and the low fire, just like the, you see how one of them's holding the torch up and one of them's holding it down? That would be like akin to the tropics, the tropic of Cancer in the summer, the tropic of Capricorn in the winter. However, in this period, using that, using the, uh, the fixed signs, that would be the sun in the center, the sun at the vernal equinox in Taurus, and then the, to the left there, the sun in Leo, right? Because Leo would be, in, in that configuration, Leo would be the sun of solstice. And then on the left, the sun in Aquarius, because Aquarius would be at the winter solstice. So there's really, and as if they, as if they uh, didn't make it clear enough in that symbolism, you could see a zodiacal wheel on several. I don't know if you could see that, but there's, there's definitely there are. You can see Libra up there, and in that bar relief, that circular bar relief, there's uh, the goat with the fish tail, Capricorn. So it's it's they're kind of spelling it out for you there that it's meant to be looked at among other things, as astrological symbolism. Now, if we look a little deeper into Mithraism, we find that uh, they met in Mithraea, or, or underground grottos, or sometimes made to look like underground grottos. And uh, they were closely associated during the period when they were adopted by the Roman legionaries. When Mithraism was adopted as the preferred cult of the Roman legionaries, there was another cult around that time uh, coming over from Turkey, that of the Magna Mater. So the Magna Mater, or the Great Mother, was uh, a cult, as I said, originating in Turkey, a cult of Kybeli, Sibeli, um, that uh, made it over. And there was, there was possibly some conflation between those two cults, that of the Magna Mater and that of Mithras. So um, I bring up the cult of Magna Mater because they, they took part in something called a Torabolium. A Torabolium was a bull sacrifice. They would take the initiate and literally put them in a, a, a hole in the ground, just like you see there. And then they would slit the throat of a bull, a sacrificial bull, and do a, a baptism in the blood of the bull. Now there is some reason to suspect, uh, and you can read this in Angus's Mystery Religions, there's some reason to suspect that there was a little conflation between Mithraism and the cult of the Magna Mater, particularly as it pertains to the Torah Bolin, and that is why would the, why would the Mithraea be built? They were nearly always built by a water ford, right? Built by a water ford and subterranean. Now, one reason that Angus uh, theorizes is that they would have to do a rinse of the, you know, they would have to bring the water in to rinse out all this bull's blood. Otherwise, how, how are you going to do that? So they were built by a waterfall, right? In fact, evidence of that uh, 
when they were when they were founding Oxford, England, right? There was a Mithraeum found there because uh, the Roman legionaries made it pretty far into uh, what we now think of as the UK. They made it as far up as into Scotland. You can see Hadrian's Wall built by Roman legionaries. Uh, so they made it pretty far up, and these people were Mithraic initiates, a lot of them. It was the soldiers' religion. And uh, there was one Mithraeum found uh, at a point where um, they saw the, the Tauroctony, that image of Mithras, that bas relief of Mithras, and they saw that it was by a water ford, and the name of the city became Oxford, due to the due to them finding this uh, this uh, water ford and the Torah to there. All right, so now to get into some Freemasonry here, the Royal Arch Banner. As you can see clearly, that heraldic crest right there has the man, the lion, the ox, and the eagle. Uh, and in bordering that, that crest or heraldic shield are the, what could be construed as the, you know, a St. John sort of configuration or Cautes and Cautapetes, same situation as we find in the Tauroctony, the Mithraic Tauroctony. Uh, and they themselves are androspaces in, in, in their form. So, that's a pretty plain picture of something that could clearly be read as astrological symbolism in Freemasonry, uh, particularly relating to the fixed signs, Taurian age symbols. Uh, one thing I've been kind of leaving out is our, well, I'll get into it in a second. Uh, now, there's another Royal Arch tracing board there. Now, you see this comes from a different this comes from a different precessional period because you'll see that at the the arch they have Cancer there, not Leo. So this would be a, what is that? Then? Cancer is cardinal, right? right? I think Cancer is a cardinal sign. So this would have been a, a cardinal configuration of when these uh, of the summer solstice, the summer solstice occurring in Cancer, as it does now tropically. So, and but also beneath that you see another heraldic shield with the man, the lion, the ox, and the eagle on it. Um, and also the working tools, which we can get into in, in their astronomical interpretation. So here, getting into uh, a body that's associated with uh, Freemasonry right, is the is the Masonic Rosicrucians, SRIC. So there are, I know it's kind of hard to see here, but each of those pentagrams on the arms of the cross there are surrounded by uh, the sign for Aquarius, for the eagle, Aquila, for Leo, and for Taurus on, on four of the five points of, that, of those pentagrams. Also, there are officers in a Rosicrucian college that are called the Four Ancients. And the Four Ancients are each assigned to a certain cardinal direction. And, and I wish you could see that, but on each of those sashes there, there is the sign for all the way to the uh, to the right there, the sign for Taurus and the symbol for Earth, the elemental symbol for Earth. Then the sign for uh, Aquarius and the elemental symbol for Air. The sign for Scorpio and the elemental symbol for Water. And then the red would be for Leo and the elemental symbol for fire. So their elemental sign and their zodiacal sign are on those, uh, those uh, sashes. 
Now here's something that's going to kind of drive it home for Freemasons. Uh, if you look on any, pretty much any of our cornerstones on any of our buildings, uh, they'll sometimes have two dates. They might have the Anno Domini date, uh, which now will be 2019, of course, but they will also have the Anno Lucas date. Anno Lucas is Latin for the year of light. And uh, how do you get the Anno Lucas? Is you add 4,000 years to the current year. So right now it is 6019. Anna Lucas, that's a Masonic dating system. Uh, where does that point to? The Anna Lucas points exactly to, uh, you know, what we presume to be the beginning of the Torian age. So there's another pretty conspicuous pointer. Hey, look here. Look from this temporal vantage point to interpret our symbol sets. And if you do that, you know, you could look at uh, Masonic symbolism. Mithraic symbolism, uh, symbolism and ceremonial magic, etc., from a, a more sort of cohesive perspective. So, getting into ceremonial magic for a minute, I'm just it up a bit. Uh, getting into ceremonial magic for a minute, we see per Persian magi. You've heard about the magi uh, visiting at the birth of Jesus Christ, right? And uh, now Magi, uh, a, a Magi is a practitioner of Zoroastrian, uh, Zoroastrian ritualism, right? That's where we get the word Magi. Um, magi and magic and mage and words like that, magician, all of these things have their root in uh, the Magian tradition, which was encapsulated in Zoroastrianism. And Zoroastrianism is a very Torian centric religion, as we've talked about, right? It's a Torian age system, always reverting back to that age. Uh, now, these people, the Persians at that time, were uh, very accomplished astronomers, or mathematici, as they as they were called after the Hellenic sort of adoption of those astronomical principles. Um, so we see a lot of divination, a lot of astrological magic occurring around that time. Um, also, we get our, our sexagesimal base 60 system from that. <clears throat> so if you see, when we talk about something being 360 degrees or 180 degrees, or 60 seconds in a minute, or 60 minutes in an hour, uh, we have the Chaldean or Babylonian astronomers to thank for that. So, when you see numbers that are, uh, you know, divisible by that, or factors of that, such as 72, 36, uh, 72 is a pretty big number in certain Masonic circles, and definitely in certain magic circles, Solomonic magic, 72, Goetic demons, uh, 72 angels, etc. Um, so, let's get that one. Speaking of that, the Shem HaMeferash. The Shem HaMeferash is, uh, can, it can be found in the Sefer Raziel. It's the 72 names of God it's been referred to. Uh, it is said they were used by Moses I, in Exodus 14, 19 through 21. Uh, Moses used the 72 names of God to part the Red Sea. Uh, so this was this was a a magical device. Whether it was something that was used as a pronunciation, or whether it was something that was astrologically rendered in this sort of uh, uh, in a magical sense, these things were hermetically related. It's a lot to bite off, I know, but they were this. There was a. The ancients thought of a cosmic sympathy. And ancient Neoplatonists and Hermeticists, Hermeticists believed in a cosmic sympathy between the, that which is above and that which is below. So, and that the microcosm reflects the macrocosm and vice versa. And that there was a relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm. So, in harnessing that cosmic those cosmic sympathies, those subtle energies, they were able to do uh, 
you know, various forms of sympathetic magic corresponding works of magic. We can also see that in uh, the jinn, Solomon's jinn, which are related to, well, you can read about the jinn, there were 72 jinn, and they helped, ostensibly they helped create Solomon's temple, uh, they were also used in some versions of the story, um, and you can hear about, you can read about them in the Arabian Nights, and you can read about them in the Quran as well. Solomon utilizing through his uh, his seal, having power over the brass vessels, which in which were uh, these jinn. Uh, another way that these jinn are sometimes brought up uh, are as doetic demons, right? Now, when I say demon, I don't mean Linda Blair head spinning Pazuzu demons. I mean, I mean uh, a demon in kind of, I guess, maybe the more platonic sense, right? And uh, these are these are aspects of that subtle energy, right? Aspects of that 72 degree division of the ecliptic, right? Because there's just a backtrack into astrology here. There's a 30 degree house, 30 degree segment of the ecliptic that a sign of the zodiac inhabits. That can be divided into, into three deacons. They're called three 10 degree deacons. Those 10 degree deacons can further be divided into aquinas, five and five, per deacon, right? So when you take those and spread those across the ecliptic or across the belt of the zodiac, zoo diapos, right? Uh, you find that, that there are 72 divisions. And these 72 divisions are, are concentrations of these subtle energies that can be drawn on in you know, certain forms of magical work. Uh, in fact, you find, uh, you find most of this goetic material in the first section of the uh, Lamegaton, right? The Lamegaton was uh, otherwise known as the Clavicula Solomonis Regis, or the lesser key of Solomon the king. The king. So, Solomonic magic, goetic magic, some of us know of the uh, significance in Freemasonry of King Solomon. Right? So there is definitely a connection there in terms of uh, the extra scriptural narratives regarding this king, you know, particularly those in the Arabian Nights and the Quran, and in other grimoire traditions, medieval grimoire traditions. One of the most to touch a little more on magic, just to hammer that home, one of the most uh, ubiquitous rituals, probably the first one a lot of people learn if, they, if they're getting into ceremonial magic or a lot, a lot of other types of magic, is the lesser ritual of the pentagram. And I'll say that, not the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, pentagram not the lesser invoking ritual of the just the lesser ritual of the pentagram. That's a golden dawn ritual. And uh, you can see a diagram of it right there in the upper right. And uh, it involves calling on these, uh, the protective powers of, of the Sphinx, basically. Right? Because at each of those cardinal directions, they're associated with fixed signs. And there's a certain visualization in certain versions of that ritual where you are to bring about the element and the zodiacal animal or creature, one of those four living creatures, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man, at each of those cardinal points. And uh, they correspond, of course, to the fixed signs. They correspond to the cherubim who are surrounding uh, the the woman on the, who coincidentally has her legs crossed like Pati's and Patapati's, holding one up and one down. 
just like Prakti's and Praktapati's in the Torah. So I would suspect astro astrological symbolism there, you know, just because you've got the four living creatures, you've got the four fixed signs, you've got her crossing one leg like that, one arm, one down. Uh, sometimes more explicitly in other in in other decks, like the right away. But uh, so there's certain tells, you know. We keep seeing this. Uh, we keep seeing this Torian symbolism come up. Now, just to bring it back into Freemasonry, this is the second to the last slide. Uh, to bring it back into Freemasonry, um, if you've read my book, and some of you have. This is a lot to bite off. I'm really trying to just get it into one thing. But I really want to stress that Torian perspective, 4000 BC, it's the Anna Lucas, right? And to look from that perspective at some of our ritualism, particularly vis-a-vis -vis ceremonial magic, Mithraism, and classical mythology. These things are all united, you know? And I've I try to really get that across in my book. I get into all the minutia in there, or a lot of it, you know, to help support that. Um, but looking at Freemasonry, you can see that same royal arch banner there. You can see the Urim and Thummim on his, those 12 stones, those 12 gems representing the, the, uh, the signs of the zodiac. Uh, you can see certain activities, I don't want to really talk about them right now, but certain activities that we do in Lodge that have, that are banishing. Uh, we do, we definitely clearly do invoking, right? Invoking the blessings, etc. Um, uh, the presence of King Solomon in our rituals, some of the, we have extra spiritual events. We have a very pronounced solar allegory uh, present in Masonic ritual um, that that I expound upon in there based on the work of Robert Hewitt Brown. If you've never read Robert Hewitt Brown, I highly recommend that. He did a lot. To, I mean, he, he did a lot to really flesh out that solar allegory in, in, in our central allegory in Freemasonry. Um, Again, so why is this important? Uh, I think this is important because the theoretical value of Torian symbolism uh, is uh, is a key to ceremonial magic, to to uh, astrology, to classical mythology, and can be used as a key to our work as Masons in in a in a pretty big way. A pretty significant way, particularly if you're the sort of Mason who likes Mason who likes to synthesize information like that. Our Anna Lucas is a is a tremendous vantage point. Uh, it's important because it's it's transformative, right? What do we do? We make good men better in Freemasonry. How do we do that? We do that by our ritualism. Uh, when you're making good men good men better, and you're doing that through theurgical intercession, then uh, one might argue that you're doing magic at that point. Um, that's the energy. So we're also, we also have a lot of Neoplatonic and Hermetic cosmic sympathies going on. We have a lot of microcosm, macrocosmic, microcosmic relationships going on in our work. Uh, the tops of those two uh, pillars, those globes surmounting those pillars there. Um, one is the terrestrial sphere, one is the celestial sphere. And how do those relate to each other as the microcosm and the macrocosm? Uh, I'd love to talk. I'd love to keep going for like three more hours. But, uh, could, but and I'm really trying to hang on. And I'm excited about it. It's a difficult thing to talk about. But if you want to talk to me more about that, um, do we got a couple of minutes for a QA? But thanks, thanks so much. I want to thank again.